Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your very warm welcome to Washington. It's a pleasure for me to be here. It's only the second time in my life I've been in the country's capital, but over the years I've enjoyed a very close relationship with many of your distinguished universities throughout the United States. The Oxford Natural History Museum is a very interesting building and an interesting place. And certain famous things in history have occurred there. And one of them was the debate between Thomas Henry Huxley and Bishop Wilberforce in 1860, just after the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species. And in the picture that you now see on the screen, uh, you will see that history museum, but the debaters are not Huxley and Wilberforce, they're Dawkins and Lennox. <laughs> and if you look very carefully, the photography is not brilliant. You will see that we are seated one on each side of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, <laughs> which during the lecture, the discussion threatened to collapse on top of us and engulf us. The picture at the bottom right hand side is of a debate I had with the late Christopher Hitchens. And the question we're facing tonight is a question that's enormously important, particularly around the Western world. Cosmic chemistry. Do science and God mix? And of course very powerful voices are saying that they do not mix. And the new atheism represented by books by Dawkins and Hitchens and Sam Harris, Dan Dennett, and various other people are extremely influential in spreading the idea that it's no longer intellectually credible to believe in God. Not all the voices are those of scientists. For instance, the book in the middle at the bottom is by the French Michel Onfray, who's a philosopher, and on the continent and in Britain and the United States, there are powerful voices that suggest belief in God and science are incompatible. Uh, Steven Weinberg won the Nobel Prize in Physics, and he said the world needs to wake up from the long nightmare of religion. Anything we scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion should be done and may in fact be our greatest contribution to civilization. Please notice the totalitarian timbre in that statement. Anything we scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion. Religion's like a crazy old aunt. She was beautiful once. She's been with us a long time. When she's gone, we may miss her. And immediately after he made that statement a few years ago, Richard Dawkins chimed in and said, I'm utterly fed up with the respect that we have been brainwashed into bestowing upon religion. Now, when people at that level of science say they do not believe in God, and we shouldn't either, the world tends to take notice. And so I want to try to help you navigate this discussion. It's a huge topic, and we could spend many hours on it, but I want to give you some pointers that will help you navigate what's going on. And so we'll have a look briefly at the main contentions of the new atheism. Firstly, religion of any kind inhibits joy and is a dangerous delusion that must be eliminated. Secondly, how shall we eliminate it? Well, science has got the cultural authority to do it, since science demands atheism. And if we're concerned about ethical behavior, then ethical behavior does not require God anyway. And uh, the famous bus that traveled around some of the major cities in Britain and on the continent with the caption on the side, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. And you can see that 
that associates in people's minds the idea of belief in God with worry and lack of enjoyment. It's very interesting to see an advert that contains the word probably. <laughs> if you were to advertise an automobile and it said, this car will probably last for a year, I'm not sure that anybody would buy it, but that's just by the by. <laughs> this was a very cheap way of advertising atheism. And the implications of their position are firstly that atheism is the default position, and they, with no apparent modesty, call themselves the brights. So the rest of us are the dims, and I presume I am very dim because I am on the extreme end of the spectrum opposite to that of the brights. Secondly, science has supreme authority, and thirdly, science and belief in God are incompatible. Now, the first important thing is to realize that there's a wider perspective in this. That the question is not really, does science conflict with belief in God? I will argue that it does not. What we're dealing with is not a conflict between science and religion at all, really. It is a clash of worldviews. Now, you can see that relatively easily by considering the Nobel Prize for Physics. It's very interesting, incidentally, that if you take the 100 years between 1900 and 2000, about 65% of Nobel Prize winners have been believers in God. That's a Wikipedia statistic, so you might need to take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> but nevertheless, there is a strong tradition of belief in God. And if you narrow your interest in the Nobel Prize for Physics, here we have Steven Weinberg on the one hand, who's an atheist, and Charles Townes, who invented the, the Maser, was a Christian. And that fact that you have Nobel Prize winners in physics on both sides of the divide tells you that the conflict is not between science and religion. Because if it really were, you would have no Nobel Prize winners believing in God at all. They'd all be atheists. What that shows you is that the real difference is the difference in their worldview. Stephen Weinberg, an atheist. Charles Townes, a Christian. So the worldviews that are at stake in the contemporary world and for our purposes of debate, the main two are naturalism and theism. And for naturalism, the universe is all that exists. For theism, the universe is not all that exists. There is a God who created it and sustains it. For naturalism, ultimate reality is mass energy, the multiverse, or most popularly these days, nothing. But we might come to that later. For theism, the ultimate reality is God and not the universe. Now, those views have implications for something that is central to this debate. And that is the answer to the question, what do we mean by explanation? And I shall be dealing with that in some detail. But if you're a naturalist, then ultimately all explanation must be bottom up because there is no top. There is no God. There's no transcend transcendence. And so the universe has got to explain itself bottom up. But in the theistic worldview, the potentiality for explanation is much greater because the universe itself shows that we need both bottom up and top down explanation. So worldview affects what you believe an explanation is and therefore by implication affects your concept of what science itself is. For the naturalist, the universe gives no evidence of God. And for a theist like myself, the universe gives us a great deal of evidence for God. Now, if the conflict is a worldview conflict, then the real question is this. Where does science fit? Does it lead to naturalism, as in Dawkins' case? Or does it lead to theism, as in my case? Or does it lead nowhere? Is it 
strictly neutral. And what I want to do is give you a rough guide to why the worldviews are clashing and the use that's made or the misuse that's made of science in it. So the alleged conflict between God and science is fueled by a series of false notions about certain things. First of all, about the results of science. Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. What he's really doing there is using the results of science, Sigmund Freud and his views on delusion. A false notion about that. Secondly, a false notion about the nature of faith. What do we mean when we use the word faith? There's enormous confusion in our society because the new atheists have redefined faith to mean believing where there is no evidence. And then false views about the nature of God as an explanation. And then as well, false views about the reach of science and the nature of scientific explanation. So we've got a number of things to look at, and we'll have to look at them very briefly, I fear. So be thinking of your questions. I'm looking forward to the question time, and if you don't write your question down as they occur to you, you'll forget them, and then you'll wish afterwards. So let's just look at these briefly. I'll start with the results of science, because you see, if you claim that God is a delusion, you're really claiming to use psychology or psychiatry as your base. Delusion comes from the Latin de ludere, to play with someone in a mocking way. And Richard Dawkins defines it quite reasonably as a persistent false belief held in the face of strong contradictory evidence. And notice this, especially as a symptom of psychiatric disorder, but he doesn't go down that route. Now I want to claim that atheism fits that definition beautifully. <laughs> it's a persistent false belief held in the face of strong contradictory evidence but I leave out the bit about psychiatric disorder. And uh, the author of the, <coughs> Richard Piercing, who uh, wrote a book called uh, Motorcycles and Zen and so on, he said this, and Dawkins quotes it, when one person suffers from a delusion, it is called insanity. When many people suffer from delusion, it is called uh, religion. Now here's Dawkins' concept of delusion. This delusion is that there exists a superhuman, supernatural intelligence who deliberately designed and created the universe and everything in it, including us. That's the delusion. His non-delusional alternative is any creative intelligence of sufficient complexity to design anything comes into existence only as the end product of an extended process of gradual evolution. Now, how do we cope with this? First I notice Dawkins is not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Secondly, I notice that I'm not one either. Now, this means that both of us are now going outside our professional zone of competence. Now that's inevitable in a topic like this. I'm not talking to you tonight about pure mathematics because you would leave the room in droves within five minutes <laughs> unless you were professionally involved in mathematics. So I'm going to have to talk about things that are outside my strictly professional competence. Now, when you do that, what are the ground rules? The first ground rule is you check with the experts in the field you're wandering into. So I checked with top psychiatrists. What do they feel? And I'll tell you. Because here's one of the top people in the world, Andrew Sims, former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. The statement that all religious belief is delusion is both erroneous and innately hostile. Although the content of delusion may be religious, the whole of belief of itself is not and cannot be a delusion. That's what a top psychiatrist thinks. And he backs up his thinking 
in <coughs> a very interesting argument, saying that there is a large body of meta-studies, that is, studies of studies, epidemiologically done, that shows a positive correlation between belief in God and all kinds of factors that we would normally associate with well-being. Lower rates of de depression, lower rates of narcotic abuse, better stable relationships, a huge list of these things. And then he says this. He says, if the evidence of these meta-studies had gone in the opposite direction and shown that belief in God was bad for you in some sense, it would have been front page news in every newspaper in the world. But because it goes the other way, he says, this fact is the best kept secret of psychiatry. So Dawkins says belief in God is a delusion. The psychiatrists say you've got it wrong. Who am I to believe? when I'm not a psychiatrist. And that bothers me, ladies and gentlemen, because I find this with Dawkins and others again and again. They do not seem to be aware of the serious results by the experts in the fields they're citing to promote their atheism. And that's intellectually dishonest, actually. And so it is a serious charge. Now, We'd better have a look at Freud because many people read the God delusion and that's the end of the God story for them. They think that God is a wish fulfillment and so on, referring to what Freud thought. One of Germany's leading psychiatrists is Manfred Lutz and he's written a very entertaining book called Eine kleine Geschichte des Größten. <laughs> Unfortunately, it hasn't been translated from German to English yet. So, it might be an effort for some of you to read it. But the basic thesis of this book is fascinating. Manfred Lutz says, if God does not exist, then Freud gives you a wonderful explanation of religion as delusion, if God does not exist. But then he says, of course, if God does exist, then Freud will give you a wonderful explanation why atheism is a delusion. The desire not to have to face God. But on the substantive question as to whether God exists or not, Freud cannot help. Now that's extremely important to realize that the argument works both ways. If you're going to say religion is a wish fulfillment, then you can equally well say either atheism is a wish fulfillment and those two statements bypass the real question as to whether there is a God or not. On the wish fulfillment side of atheism, Cheswaf Miwash won the Nobel Prize for Literature and he, had, he knew what he was talking about when he wrote a true opium of the people is a belief in nothingness after death. The huge solace of thinking that our betrayals, greed, cowardice, murders are not going to be judged. And a rather amusing sidelight on all of this was when Stephen Hawking was asked what he thought of religion in one of our national papers and he said religion is a fairy story for those afraid of the dark. And they were kind enough to ask me my view. And I said atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. <laughs> Well, it is very kind of you to clap, but that shows you haven't followed the argument <laughs> because neither of those statements actually proves anything at all. <laughs> so, uh, how far have we got? We've looked at results of science within psychology and psychiatry and seen that if you go to the experts, they do not substantiate the central claim of the new atheist. So that's the first point. The second point, False ideas about the nature of faith. Dawkins' famous statement that a case can be made that faith is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus but harder to eradicate. Faith being belief that isn't based on evidence is the principal vice of any religion. And what's happening here is that he's confusing faith with blind faith. Faith as we'll see in a moment, is an ordinary word that means trust, 
But if you confuse faith with blind faith, you end up writing nonsense. For instance, atheists have no faith. And then he writes a 400-page book about what atheists believe. <laughs> Peter Singer, who ought to know better, one of the most distinguished philosophers of the world, an ethicist at Princeton, atheism is not a faith. That is sheer nonsense. Christopher Hitchens, uh, well, he just got into such a mess over this, but I'll let you see what he says. If one must have faith to believe in something, then the likelihood of that something having truth or value is considerably diminished. And I asked him, did he believe in his own existence? Did he have faith that he himself exists? Because if he has faith that he himself exists, the likelihood of him existing is diminished seriously. <laughs> And in one of his books, he says, our principles are not a faith, our beliefs are not a belief. Well, that's just sheer and utter nonsense. <laughs> and I take this very seriously. If people are going to defend atheism by this kind of methodology, it's not impressing me. The Oxford English Dictionary will tell us that faith means belief, trust, that which produces belief, evidence, token, pledge, engagement, trust in its objective aspect, troth, observance of trust, fidelity, confidence, reliance, and belief. That's the normal use. Fides, fidelity. And of every statement of faith, I believe X, we can ask the question on the basis of what evidence? And evidence-based faith is the normal thing. Now, I can speak as a Christian tonight. Other faiths must speak for themselves, but the Christian faith is evidence-based. Uh, when John's explaining what is involved in his fourth gospel, he said many other things Jesus did in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Here's the evidence upon which faith is based. Now this is so important because many people in our society, and I have many colleagues in Oxford and elsewhere, that when I use the word faith, they think it means I'm believing without any evidence, so I'm not worth talking to. So it's very important to make extremely clear that what we mean is we're committed to something on the basis of evidence and to explain that evidence to them. And one of the reasons the C.S. Lewis Institute exists is to help people marshal that evidence in the way that C.S. Lewis did. The other thing it obscures is that atheists have no faith. But you see, every scientist is a believer, not necessarily in God, but has faith in science. And this is a very important notion. Sometimes it goes to an absurd extreme. And we end up with scientism. That is, science is the only way to truth. Bertrand Russell once wrote, whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods, and what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. Now, Russell was quite a philosopher, mathematician, and logician, but his logic left him when he wrote this sentence. Because the sentence itself, this statement, is not a scientific statement. So you cannot know it. So if it's true, it's false. Isn't that right? Or is it too late at night for logic? <laughs> Honesty will tell us that Sir Peter Medawar, also a Nobel Prize winner, was right when he says the existence of a limit to science is made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions having to do with first and last things. Questions such as, how did everything begin? What are we all here for? What's the point of living? Science cannot answer every question. But now here comes something very important. All scientists believe that science can be done. That goes without saying. But it's extremely important to ask the question why they do that. Now, if science and faith in God are inimical, well, science would hardly ever have got going because it is the fact that all the early pioneers of modern science were believers in God. 
Lewis summed it up beautifully. Men became scientific because they expected law of nature, and they expected law of nature because they believed in a lawgiver. In other words, faith in God didn't hinder their science. It was the motivation that drove that science. And Edwin Judge, a brilliant Australian historian, says, Christianity, or above all the biblical doctrine of creation, is itself the creator of the methodology of modern science. We don't hold the Greeks' perspective anymore, in spite of the fact that people keep looking back to it as the origin of science. It's not the origin of science. The book of creation is the origin of modern science, the book of Genesis. And it's very interesting to trawl back through some of the luminaries of the rise of science. Galileo, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forgo their use. Or Johannes Kepler, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. Or the genius Isaac Newton, don't doubt the creator because it is inconceivable that accidents alone could be the controller of this universe. And there we reach the high point of genius. Newton probably was the brightest scientist that has ever lived. But his chair remained in Cambridge for many years until it was occupied by Stephen Hawking. Hawking, the Times announcement, God did not create the universe. And in order to simplify the discussion, but perhaps get very quickly now to the heart of it, I want us to compare and contrast Newton and Hawking. Newton gave us the law of gravity. Hawking works on gravity, black holes. The interesting thing about the two of them is this, that Isaac Newton believed in God. Stephen Hawking, who occupied Newton's chair at Cambridge, uses gravity as a reason not to believe in God. Newton used it as a reason to believe in God. That's fascinating, isn't it? That's such an interesting puzzle because it raises the question, how do we get from Newton to Hawking? And Hawking's argument is because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. So, how do we get from Newton's theism to Hawking's atheism? two major steps. Firstly, false ideas about the nature of God. And secondly, false ideas about the nature of scientific explanation. Now, the first false idea about the nature of God is the God of the gaps. There are two scientists doing some serious work on a blackboard, explained to the left-hand equation, and then there's a very complicated thing on the right, and in the middle there's a big gap, and it says, then a miracle occurs. And one scientist says to the other, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. <laughs> and the basic idea here is that people will say, well, here's something we can't explain that we have found in the cosmos and biology. I can't explain it, therefore God did it. And that's what we mean by the God of the gaps. Now, why is that important? Because that's what Stephen Hawking believes I believe. God of the gaps, like an ancient Greek god depicted at the bottom there, the god of thunder or lightning, who disappears when you have your first lecture in atmospheric physics at any decent university. You don't need the god of lightning. It's a god of the gap. It disappears with the advance of science. Is that clear? Now, follow the logic of this because this is immensely important. If you define God to be the explanation for what science has not yet explained, then of course you have to choose between God and science as a matter of logic. Let me step back from that statement. You see, what Hawking is saying, Dawkins is saying, 
Dennett is saying that you must choose between science and God. You can't have both. The reason they put that choice up is not simply a problem with science, it's a problem with their concept of God. Because they think that someone like me believes in a God who's simply a temporary placeholder, a kind of X. I can't explain it, therefore God did it. And a bit more scientific advance will get rid of that God. Now I repeat what I say here. If that's how you define God, then of course you have to choose between God and science because it comes out of your definition of God. It took me many years to realize that that is what was going on. But you see, the God of the Bible is not a God of the gaps. He's God of the whole show. You may be familiar with part of page one of the Bible. The first statement is, in the beginning, God created the bits of the universe we don't yet understand. <laughs> well, not exactly if you've read the text. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a merism. The heavens and the earth, that is everything. The whole show, the bits we do understand and the bits we don't. Now, once you've grasped that, that will give you a very profound insight into what is going on. The New Testament version of that is, in the beginning was the word, all things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be that came to be. This is a very profound statement. And you may want to ask me the question. I'm not going to stop to answer it now. But this answers the question, who created the Creator, which you may have heard many times. So a false idea of God is driving a huge part of the debate. And we need to get across to people, well, actually, we don't believe in a God like that. And that leads to the next thing, false ideas about the nature of scientific explanation. What do we mean by explanation? For instance, what does the law of gravity explain? Now, when I was at school, I learned the law of gravity, and I later learned how to use it to derive the motion of the planets and so on. It's very exciting stuff to teach. It's beautiful mathematics. But when I first heard the law of gravity, I thought it explained what gravity was. It doesn't, you know. Newton realized that, but he said it in Latin, and nobody quite understood what he was saying. <laughs> non fingo hypothesi. But you see, nobody, even today, knows what gravity is. If you don't believe me, read Richard Feynman, one of the most distinguished American Nobel Prize winners for physics. Nobody knows what gravity is. The law of gravity is brilliant. It enables us to do calculations that will land a person on the moon without even Einstein's corrections. But it doesn't tell you what gravity is. In other words, the existence of the law is not a complete explanation, even within science. This is enormously important to realize. And the man that encapsulated it best was Ludwig Wittgenstein, the philosopher. The great delusion of modernity, he wrote, is that the laws of nature explain the universe for us. The laws of nature describe the universe. They describe the regularities, but they explain nothing. That's the delusion of modernism. So what about explanation? Well, let's have a look at explanation. Why is the water boiling? Well, the heat from the Bunsen burner flame is being conducted through the copper base of the kettle is agitating the molecules of water. They're moving faster and faster. That's why it's boiling. Mm. Actually, it's boiling because I would love a cup of tea. <laughs> now, you laugh, of course, because if I were to tell you that those explanations contradict each other, you would say I was talking nonsense. But they're different kinds of explanation, ladies and gentlemen. The one is a scientific explanation. The other is an agent explanation. My desire, my intention, my volition. And the interesting thing is, it's the more important explanation outside physics. 
People were making tea for thousands of years before they understood the theory of heat conduction. Now this is utterly elementary, but it's the heart of the problem of the misunderstanding that lies at the core of the science or God in the contemporary world. How does that happen? Because the same is true of the universe. The scientific explanation only gives you one viewpoint. How it works. How the water boils. It doesn't obviate the explanation at the level of personal agency. So we have two kinds of explanation, one in terms of scientific law and mechanism, and the other in terms of personal agency. And let me put it this way. God no more competes with science as an explanation for our universe than Henry Ford competes with the law of internal combustion as an explanation for a motor car engine. Have you got that? It's very simple. And yet, as far as I can see, there's a huge number of leading philosophers and scientists cannot see the difference. So when Newton discovered his law of gravity, he didn't say, I've got a law of gravity, I don't need God. No, he said, what a marvelous God who did it that way. The more he understood of science, the more he worshipped the God who did it that way way. So this is a very simple thing that everybody can understand. I find school kids can understand this much more rapidly than many professors. It's a sad tragedy. They can see the different kind of explanation as it goes round. I'm just going to make a couple more points and then I'm going to stop for a while at least. The final point here is does explanation always go from the simple to the complex? Now this is a very important atheist argument. Richard Dawkins, using God as an explanation is absurd since God is by definition more complex than the thing you're explaining. That sounds wonderful stuff until you apply it to his own works. As I did in my debate with him, I said, Richard, I come across a book called The God Delusion. It's quite complicated. It's about 400 pages, a lot of words in it, and so on. Um, and then I ask about its origin. And somebody tells me it comes from the infinitely more complicated mind of Richard Dawkins. So I can't accept that explanation because it's more complex than the thing you're explaining. <laughs> nonsense, you see. But why it's nonsense is very important. Explanation that goes from simple to complex, which we call reductionist, is very important in every branch of life. All of us, when solving a big problem, try to split it up into simpler problems. That's what we do, and we do it in science. But there's one area in which explanation is always more complex than the thing you're explaining. And that's where language is involved. I often illustrate this by the idea of going into a cave in China and observing two scratches on the wall. And I'm a mathematician, I know nothing about such things, I ignore it, but I'm with a, a Chinese archaeologist and she looks at this and she says, goodness me, just look at that. Human intelligence! And I say, don't be so stupid. Those are two scratches on the wall. They're so very simple. And she looks at me and says, don't you know anything about language? That's a Chinese ideogram, run for a human being. And the moment you recognize it is semiotic, that is, it carries meaning, instantly you know there's a mind behind it, even though it's only two scratches. And that's true in ordinary life. You come in for dinner to my college at Oxford and you see a menu looking like this. And often I've had fascinating discussions, and one I remember so well, and I'll tell you this. There was a world-famous biochemist who didn't enjoy sitting with me at dinner because he discovered I was a pure mathematician, and he first announced that that was very boring, <laughs> which made conversation difficult. So I tried to co 
compensate by saying I'm interested in a lot more questions in mathematics. And he said, like what? Well, I said, what about the universe? Is it created or not? Oh dear, he said, it's far worse than I thought. Um, <laughs> I'm an atheist, I'm a reductionist, we've nothing to talk about and we're going to have a miserable time. <laughs> so I said, no, we're not. I'm a reductionist too. I, I, I'm a methodological reductionist. I spit big problems, as I've mentioned to you before. And he said, I do that. Well, I said, therefore, we have something to talk about. But he said, I don't mean that. I said, I know you don't. <laughs> You're an ontological reductionist. You think that everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. He said, that's exactly right. Well, I said, let's do an experiment. He said, what here, the dinner table? I said, sure, this is Oxford. <laughs> and so we looked at the menu and I read it out. The roast chicken was there in the middle. So he said, what's the problem? I said, none whatever from my perspective, but just look at that, R-O-A-S-T, those are marks and paper. Yes, he said, but it's roast chicken. I said, how do you know? And he thought for a while, he said, well, I've learned English, that's a language, yes, and you recognize it. Now I said, okay, you're a reductionist, yes, everything in terms of physics and chemistry, absolutely. I said, okay, explain to me how those marks, R-O-A-S-T, you explain how they carry the meaning using only the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. And there was a considerable silence. And his wife said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> <laughs> but his answer stunned me. He said, it can't be done. And he said, you know, for 40 years I've gone into my laboratory in Oxford believing it could be done. It was a stunning confession. But he said, it obviously can't. And I said, half a minute, physics and chemistry have only been running for five or six hundred years. He said, it doesn't matter. It's not within the explanatory power of physics and chemistry to cope with language. And he looked at me and I could see he was thinking, you're not clever enough to have thought of that. <laughs> and I said, no, I got it from a Nobel Prize winner. Oh, he said, that's a relief. Why it was a relief, I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because you see, this man studied this stuff. Roast chicken, R-O-A-S-T, it's five letters, isn't it? How many letters are there in the genetic code of the human genome? Three and a half billion? All in the right order. I said, what about that? He said, chance and necessity. Really, I said? R-O-A-S-T, and you immediately postulate the existence of a mind behind that menu, even though many automatic processes went into producing that menu. You know, because of the semiotic nature of the letters, that there's a mind behind it somewhere. So what are you going to do with the longest word that we've ever discovered? I find it interesting to watch people's reactions when I raise the question. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the area where explanation gets more complex. And so, if we look at these two worldviews, the first one starts with mass energy or nothing or the multiverse or something like this and rises to produce mind by natural processes. The other worldview is the exact opposite. It's in the beginning was the word. And mass energy are derivative. They're not foundational. And it's not only as a Christian, but as a scientist, that I can see that the biblical view makes infinitely more sense than the non-biblical one. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do now is to just say something about what I believe is one of the most important parts of the contemporary debate, and that is thinking about thinking. Mathematics, which is my field, is a fascinating thing. Mathematics is a language, it's a highly compressed language, and it has been used to 
express some of the most fundamental ideas in theoretical physics particularly, upon which even if we don't begin to understand them, so much of contemporary life depends. And to think that equations like these have great value in helping our understanding raises questions in thinking minds. Of course, the mind that thought the most was probably that of Albert Einstein. And he was clever enough to see that there was an issue. The only incomprehensible thing about the universe, he wrote, is that it is comprehensible. How is it? Wrote Eugen Wigner, Nobel Prize winner for physics, in a famous paper much loved by mathematicians called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. It's unreasonable, isn't it? He suggested that here's a mathematician and she's thinking in here and she comes up with an equation and it appears to describe something of what we would normally think of as external reality. How does that work? How is that possible? And uh, Wigner wrote, in fact, the enormous usefulness of mathematics as something bordering on the mysterious. There's no rational explanation for it. This is his view, of course. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. And at Cambridge, I was taught quantum physics by Professor Sir John Polkinghorne. And he points out in several of his books that physics doesn't explain why mathematics works. Physics is powerless, he says, to explain its fundamental belief in the mathematical intelligibility of the universe for the very simple reason that in order to do physics, you have to believe in that mathematical intelligibility before you start. So here we have a fascinating situation. In order to do science, I must believe science can be done, otherwise I wouldn't do it. That is an article of faith. It's a commitment. And we've seen that the great pioneers of physics all believed this about mathematics believed it about the universe, that it was rationally intelligible, and they believed it because they believed there was a rational God behind it. Now let's come to the contemporary world, which is getting rid of the rational God. And so there's no God behind it. And yet we're still doing science, and we believe it can be done. And that's why I like to have fun with some of my scientific colleagues and I ask them what they do science with. And of course, they're usually thinking of very expensive machines. And I said, no, no, that's very interesting that you own a, a cyclotron or something or have one in your back garden, that's marvelous. But I mean, oh, you mean. And they're about to say mind when they remember that it's not really politically correct to say that you believe in the mind, so they say the brain. I do science with my brain. Now, I'm not going to get into the mind-brain problem. I've written about it, and I do believe the brain story and the mind story are separate. But, okay, let's go along with that. You do science with your brain. So tell me about this brain. What's the story of the brain? Well, the usual story is that the brain, the short story, is that it's the end product of a mindless, unguided process. So when I hear that, as I usually do, I look at the person who's told me that and I say, and you trust it. <laughs> That's a very disconcerting question, ladies and gentlemen. Their philosophy leads them to analyze the brain reductionistically and reduce it to physics and chemistry, but physics and chemistry that is sometimes somehow given rise to it without any meaning or significance. And then I tell them 
Do you know where I got that question from? They usually don't, and they're very surprised when I tell them the answer. It's Charles Darwin. It's Darwin's doubt. And it's a very interesting thing that he wrote with me, the horrid doubt always arises. Whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. That's Darwin's doubt. And he went on to say something like, after all, who would trust the convictions in a monkey's mind if there aren't any convictions in such a mind? You see what's happening here? He's thinking about thinking. And C.S. Lewis made the powerful point in the 1940s, but nobody really took it on board because they couldn't see so clearly what he was driving at, that we've done wonderful science by thinking about the universe, but what we've not done is think about thinking. Because when you start to think about thinking, then, of course, you have to have some grounds to believe in the validity of thinking in order to come to any conclusions at all in any field at all. Now, some atheists have begun to pick this up. John Gray is a very well-known atheist. Modern humanism, he writes, is the faith that through science humankind can know the truth and so be free. Now, listen to this. This is an atheist writing. But if Darwin's theory of natural selection is true, this is impossible. The human mind serves evolutionary success, not truth. And one of America's leading philosophers, Alvin Plantinga, has picked this up. If Dawkins is right, that we are the product of mindless, unguided natural processes, then he has given a strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties and therefore inevitably to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce, including Dawkins' own atheism. Now this fascinates me, because what it's beginning to do is to show that atheism is undermining the fundamental construct of what is necessary to believe in order to do any thinking, not simply scientific thinking. Now, the man that's caused the most trouble in this area recently is another very strong atheist called Thomas Nagel from New York. He's written a book with an extremely provocative subtitle. The book is called Mind and Cosmos. The subtitle is Why the Neo-Darwinian View of the World is Almost Certainly False. Now, the strength of Nagel's atheism is that he doesn't want there to be a God. He says so. But now, he says, all explanations come to an end somewhere. The real opposition between Dawkins' physicalist naturalism and the God hypothesis is a disagreement over whether this end point is physical, extensional, and purposeless, or mental, intentional, and purposive. On either view, the ultimate explanation is not itself explained. The God hypothesis does not explain the existence of God, and naturalistic physicalism does not explain the laws of physics. And elsewhere he writes that if we take evolutionary naturalism seriously, it threatens to undermine naturalism completely, because it invalidates thinking itself. Now, that's enormously interesting. His statement, again, this statement, I find fascinating. If the mental is not itself merely physical. Now, remember, if you are a materialist, you've got to reduce everything to the physical, including thought. And here is an atheist who wants to find a naturalistic explanation and can't find one, and writes honestly, if the mental is not itself merely physical, it cannot be fully explained by physical science. Evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. 
Now this is very serious stuff and there's a lot that can be said about it but I simply want to point up as I conclude that atheism followed to its logical conclusion undermines the validity of the very rationality we need not only for science but any thinking whatsoever. And Lewis uh, wrote some very powerful things about this and he said look any theory that invalidates thinking must be by definition false because you've reached it by thinking and if thinking is invalid then the whole thing implodes in logical chaos. Let me put it this way, my main reason or one of my main reasons for not being an atheist is not because I'm a Christian but because I'm a scientist. You see, to believe in a worldview that devalues or even invalidates the thing I'm committed to professionally would be a very curious thing to do. And it's people like, Na like Nagel who are bringing it to public attention that there's something serious going on here. There's a very serious flaw that can't be repaired. But on the other hand, from the perspective of the Christian, the intelligibility of the universe and the effectiveness of mathematics are perfectly reasonable. If there is an intelligent creator who's responsible both for the universe and for the human mind. And so we're left with these two worldviews, naturalism and theism. Naturalism making mind matter and energy, primary minded information derivative. In the beginning were the atoms and empty space, if you like. Theism, the exact opposite. Mind and information primary, matter, energy secondary. In the beginning was the word. That's where the real conflict lies. Those two worldviews are irreconcilable. There are scientists on both sides of the divide. Science is not the issue, ladies and gentlemen. It's worldview. And it's very odd to me when people, brilliant people, choose a worldview that actually undermines the very rationality in which they take pride. There is something magnificent in a cosmos that's described on its large scale by mathematical equations and where in each of the 10 trillion cells of our body there is a database with the longest word that we have ever discovered. God's fingerprints are all over the universe at the large scale and the small scale. So cosmic chemistry, do science and God mix? Yes, very well. But science and atheism don't mix. That's a proposition that some people find very startling when I say it. Let me say it again. Science and atheism don't mix very well at all. Because atheism logically leads to doubt about the very validity of the rational processes needed to do science. And that will do for tonight. Thank you very much. So let's see. Well, the very first question I've got is how do you get around the problem of the anthropic principle which states that observations of the universe must be compatible with the conscious and sapient life that observes it? Now, the anthropic principle is, for some people, a total tautology. And the basic idea is this, that obviously we must live in a universe that's compatible with our existence. That's a very obvious uh, and pretty trivial remark. And uh, people have suggested, Dawkins in particular, that the anthropic principle is an explanation of why the world is as it is. And he said you have the anthropic principle or a creator. That's sheer nonsense. The anthropic principle isn't the solution, it's the problem. Because the fact that we are in a universe that is clearly compatible with our existence 
goes nowhere to explain why the universe is as it is. Absolutely nowhere. It raises the problem. It doesn't offer any solution whatsoever. So I'm not going to say any more about that. Although, are there any new claims? I, I'm going to condense some of these questions. Um, the Christian community seems to have made great strides in answering the lies that the science community is selling as facts to the world. We need to be very careful with a statement like that. Every one of you is dependent. I bet most of you have got an iPhone or an iPod or an iPad or an iFiddle or an i whatever. <laughs> And what lies behind that, the science that lies behind that are not lies. I know what the questioner means, but we must be fair, ladies and gentlemen. We are massively indebted, especially in this part of the United States, to the vast technology industry that's going on all around us. What I think the questioner means is that it's not the science, the uh, technology itself, it's the way in which it's interpreted when it comes to these big questions. Because you see, 99.9% .9 of science doesn't raise the God question at all. Sometimes people who are not familiar with science think that uh, scientists are going around all the time thinking of how their science disproves the existence of God. No, they're not. They're trying to find out where that fits in there and how that bit of uh, bacterium can be cured and, and this and this and this. They're just not interested in that because it's not part of their professional discussion. When we meet in this kind of a circumstance, we are dealing with a tiny fraction of what comes under the name of science. But because it's written large in connection with God questions, we tend to skew our minds and think that that's the total deal. It is not the total deal. So we need to come down to a balance here. But the interesting thing here is how is the science community responding to the answers uh, when we look at science proving the existence of God? Now here there's a misunderstanding, or a, a, the danger of misunderstanding. Science can neither prove or disprove the existence of God. But in fact, in the technical sense, you can prove nothing in science itself. You can only prove it in pure mathematics, which is my field. <laughs> you see, proof has two meanings in ordinary language. It's got the rigorous mathematics meaning, you know, start with these axioms, use these rules of logic, come to these conclusions. You don't get that in physics, chemistry, or anywhere else. What you get in those areas is beyond reasonable doubt. We can advance this evidence and so on. Now, that doesn't mean that the evidence is weak. For instance, in many cases in life, we stake our lives on it. I came over here in an A380, the largest passenger aircraft in the world. I trusted it to get me here. I couldn't prove to you it would get me here. Not in the mathematical sense, but I feel there's enough evidence to trust it. Now, we must be clear about that. I can't prove to you that my wife, to whom I've been married for 48 years, I can't prove mathematically that she'd love me, but I'd stake my life on it. You got the idea? So we need to be careful about our use of proof. It's a question of evidence. So the question is, how does the scientific community react? Very differently. As I said, over half the Nobel Prize winners are believers in God. Many of my colleagues in science, some of them heads of very famous departments, are believers in God. And I think the general in interest has increased and atheists are beginning to realize that there are certain very powerful evidences for God. I was having a debate with one of Oxford's leading philosophers recently, and he was kind enough to say, I hope you're going to use your best argument. Well, I said, I will if you tell me what it is. <laughs> so he said, okay, I'll tell you what your best argument is. I said, what's my best argument? Well, he said, if I was going to become a theist, one of the things that would point me in that direction is the fine-tuning of the universe. He said, will you use that argument? I said, sure, thank you. <laughs> you see, so there are arguments that weigh with people. And 
many of our leading writers and physicists do see evidence of designing intelligence of the universe. It doesn't yet make them theists, but it tells them there's something more. And that's a good start. It's better to believe there's something more than there's something less. And I'm encouraged the way my colleagues react to the kind of thing I do, to the kind of presentation I gave you this evening. It's perfectly comprehensible because very little of it depends on difficult science. It's simply the nature and philosophy of science I'm concentrating on. And people are interested in arguments like this, very interested in arguments like this. And I see many people change their minds. I can see them changing their minds as I talk. So let's have a look at a bit more. Are the new atheist days numbered <laughs> as the evidence increases against them? That's an interesting question. One of my colleagues at Oxford, Professor Alistair McGrath, has written a book called The End of Atheism. And there is an argument that I think has some weight to it, that the, the arguments get shriller and shriller. And what interests me more is that they become nonsensical. Now, if I'd had another half hour to lecture, I would have analyzed the statement of Stephen Hawking that occurred near the beginning. Why doesn't he believe in God? Because there is a law of gravity. The universe can and will create itself from nothing. You remember that? Well, let's look at it if it's not too late for logical analysis. Because there is a law of gravity, because there's something, the universe will create itself from nothing. What? That's a flat contradiction. You don't need to know anything about gravity or anything else. It's a flat contradiction. Number two, because there is a law of gravity, not because gravity exists, and that opens a window into a huge misunderstanding that laws create things. Laws create nothing. The first example of a law Hawking gives in that book, The Grand Design, is the law that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Well, that's okay. It's a regularity that we can observe. But please notice it doesn't create the sun, nor the east, nor the west. There is a huge confusion, even among distinguished scientists. I had a, a little spat, I suppose. It was a conversation with Peter Atkins, who's a very distinguished physical chemist and has written hundreds of books, and you probably know them. They're in every uh, library in the world or bookshop on physical chemistry. So I asked him, I said, Peter, what do you think created the universe? And he said, mathematics. And I am afraid I was very impolite. I, I started to laugh. <laughs> he just caught me in one of those embarrassing moments. And he said, why are you laughing? Well, I said, Peter, let me be honest. That's the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> he said, why? Well, I said, let me put it to you simply. One plus one equals two. Did that ever put two pounds in your pocket? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I suggest to you that the financial crisis that we all suffered was caused precisely by people who believed that you could create money by doing mathematics. It's called creative accounting. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> huh, yes. C.S. Lewis saw it again, and he pointed out that laws create nothing. They don't move anything. Newton's laws of motion never moved a billiard ball in the history of the universe. People with cues do that. It is a confusion about the nature of law. And it's good that I managed to say that because it's part of what is the nature of law as explanation. So here's Hawking. Because there's something, the universe comes from nothing. Contradiction. Because there's a law of gravity. Confusion about the nature of law. Worse still. The universe can create itself. Well, if I say X creates Y, what does that mean? Well, it roughly means if you've got X, you'll get Y, doesn't it? If I say X creates X, what does that mean? It means if you've got X, you'll get X. And what does that mean? It means that nonsense remains nonsense, even if physicists are writing it. 
It is absolute nonsense. Now that is alarming because here's a world-class physicist in a best-selling book that has enormous reach and this is the central argument of the book. And it has three distinct levels of self-contradiction and absurdity built in. Now that's a challenge for you tonight. If you think it's easy to produce a statement with three separate levels of self-contradiction, you try it and you'll see it's very difficult. <laughs> I find that very disturbing indeed, that this kind of thing is taken seriously. So, are the days of the new atheist numbered? I don't know, but if they keep relying on arguments like this, Lawrence Krauss is perhaps the, the worst of the lot of them, the physicist at ASU, um, who tries to get a universe from nothing. And he thinks he succeeds by redefining nothing. And on about page three of his book, he says, now listen to this. Because something is physical, Nothing must be physical, especially if you define it as the absence of something. What? <laughs> it reminds me of that tennis player. What was his name? You can't be serious. McEnroe, was it McEnroe? You can't be serious. But that's in a serious book on cosmology. It's sheer nonsense. Now, when people begin to rely, otherwise intelligent people, on sheer nonsense, it makes me begin to think there's something very disturbing going on here. So that's just a couple of examples why I think they're simply in trouble. Is it possible that human history is shorter than the age of the Earth universe? Well, it obviously is, no matter what you believe about that age. But he doesn't ask me what I believe about that age, so I don't have to say anything about that. <laughs> Will you comment on Al Plantinga's argument that naturalism is self-defeating? Well, not really beyond what I'm saying, but what he is doing is, is taking Nagel-type argument, Lewis-type argument, and saying that if you reduce thought, thinking, to um, physics and chemistry, you empty it of all meaning. That, that's, that's, it's quite simple, really. If you do that, you simply empty it of meaning. So he's pointing out that Dawkins is a living contradiction. On the one hand, he believes in doing science. On the other hand, he believes that the universe ultimately has no meaning at all. And science, then, as a logical consequence, has no meaning because the brain itself has been assembled by a, a naturalistic, unguided process. I don't, it's not difficult to understand. It's just a wrong, um, it's just a false argument. And it needs to be repeated again and again until a majority of the population get uh, a grasp of it. There is another related question. I'm trying to relate them together. Are not the so-called new atheists just the latest example of Romans 1 of suppressing the truth? Well, it could well be, couldn't it? Because Paul describes there a, a, a mental decline. Their reasonings become foolish. Well, the examples I've given you are foolishness. And when otherwise intelligent people start to talk foolishness in this area, well, it's certainly an indicator that Paul wasn't far from the mark when he wrote that. Just because religion has a beneficial effect per some psychiatrists, that does not necessarily make it legitimate. Placebos can also make people feel better. Why do you disagree with this? I don't disagree with it. This is quite a fair argument. Just because religion has a beneficial effect doesn't make it legitimate, but it doesn't make it illegitimate either. And if it's true, you'd expect it to be beneficial. You see, I didn't use the Freudian argument in either direction as an evidence of the truth of Christianity. I was simply pointing out that it works both ways. And if you uh, argue one way, you can argue exactly the same in the opposite direction against atheism. We need better grounds for that. But you see, 
you would expect in any sensible universe that if it's true, it will be beneficial. And to argue that because the thing is beneficial, that it's false, would be going way beyond the evidence. You need more evidence, that's the point. The sort of feeling side, the benefit and so on, that's not enough. It's important, but it's not enough. All right? And I think that's all I could say about that. How does mathematics support the existence of a God, the God of the Bible, or the Christian worldview? Well, in the way in which I indicated, it's the fact we can do mathematics points towards an intelligence behind the universe. Now, that gets you a certain distance, and that helps me to say something that's very important. You can't deduce the doctrines of Christianity from mathematics, or physics, or chemistry. Paul, in that same chapter that we just mentioned, says that the invisible things of God are perceived from the things that are made. Notice he says perceived, not proved. Paul is a very seriously sharp writer. Even his everlasting power and Godhead. You can't perceive a lot about God from creation. You can perceive his everlasting power, and, well, it depends on what you experts make of the word theotokos. Does it mean that there is a God? I suspect it does, because that's the thing that makes mo most sense. You can look at the universe, and you can see the heavens declaring the glory of God, but the details of Christianity, you can't get from that. And the New Testament admits that. Paul tells you you can't. You see, it's a step, a huge step, to go from believing in some kind of creative intelligence to believing in the God of the Bible. You need a lot more evidence, and that's why Christianity has got evidence of an entirely different kind. It's not us reasoning from the universe to God, it's God revealing himself in Christ and giving us the evidence of his life, death, resurrection, uh, and so on. So you have to bring that kind of evidence into play. And it's perfectly legitimate to point out that reasoning about the universe only takes you so far, but it takes you in the right direction. It doesn't take you away from God, it moves you towards God. Is it legitimate for Christians to use methodological naturalism in their work? Does everybody understand that question? No. So we'll go to another one. <laughs> Forgive me, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Behind this question is the way in which we approach things. And uh, the words methodological naturalism now are very rarely used, even for the people that suggested they should be used in the first place. Because what it's saying is whether the universe is designed or not, we should treat it as if there isn't a God and just look for the natural explanations. Now, that gets us into a huge discussion. What is the nature of science? Is science applied naturalism? Many people believe it is. That science restricts itself to explaining natural phenomena in terms of natural processes. Now, you can define science like that if you like. Of course you can. Many people do. It's their working definition. But beware, if you do that, that you never get above what you assume. Let me illustrate that. If I have invented a machine that can only see visible light, and you come along and say, I've discovered x-rays, and I say, let me have a look, and I point my machine, and I said, I see nothing. You will rightly say to me, it's not because x-rays don't exist, it's because your machine can't detect them. Now this is very important. You see, if you only look for natural explanations, if there are things in the universe that cannot be reduced to natural explanations, you're never going to find them. 
Now, the odd thing is, <laughs> Richard Dawkins says, you know, it's terribly tempting, everything looks as if it has been designed, but it isn't actually designed. But he treats it as if it had been designed. That's methodological theism. <laughs> isn't that interesting? Methodological theism and methodological naturalism are almost identical when you look at them carefully. And so I feel the terms are not very useful. But I think if you're going to say an explanation, a scientific explanation, we're back to it. What do we mean by explanation? You see, in the example I gave you of the roast chicken, you can't account for that without mind. Now, is mind natural? That's a very important question. See, when we think of the supernatural, we tend to think of what we call miracles, like the resurrection and so on. Now, C.S. Lewis does us a great service here, and this would really need a lengthy explanation, but I'm only going to point you in the right direction. Lewis makes the point, and I've made it implicitly, but not explicitly. My argument is really saying that the mind is supernatural. You don't have to start with miracles to get the supernatural. The mind cannot be explained naturalistically. Therefore, it must be supernatural. Do you see that? Now, it's good to hold on to that and follow that through. There's a lot more to be said, of course. Because what do we mean by the mind cannot be explained? Isn't that proving a negative and so on and so forth? I'm well aware of all that kind of stuff. But it's important to see that Lewis made the point that human rationality is a sort of door into the supernatural. Because if you reduce it to natural processes, then of course it invalidates thinking. But thinking is valid, we all believe that. So the mind cannot be purely natural. And that's hugely important, because a lot of people reject miracles for all kinds of false reasons, but they reject them. But when you approach them with the status of the human mind, that's a very different thing. And it begins to open up possibilities of which most of have never thought. You say that Christianity is an evidence-based religion. Upon what evidence do you then base your Christian faith? Well, how long have you got? <laughs> Let me summarize it briefly. There's evidence at different levels. There's what I roughly call objective evidence. Evidence that's outside of me. And then there's subjective evidence. On the objective evidence, we start with the existence of God, the kind of arguments I've brought. But this asks about Christianity. It's not actually our topic for tonight, but I feel that because the questioner has asked it, I must be fair and try and give an answer. Is that all right? Or would you rather I avoided this? No. Okay, let's, 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 let's go for it. The next step is outside of me is the whole of what I'd call Christian history, or the biblical revelation. The fact of the existence of Jesus, his life, his death, his interaction with people, and his resurrection. The New Testament claims that it is evidence for that. I take that very seriously. And there are various ways in which we can check it. How many people, historians, have set out to prove that Christianity is false by, for instance, Luke is a historian of wonderful capacity, but they haven't believed that, so they've started to say, well, when he writes about the ancient Near East, he gets a lot of stuff wrong, he gets place names wrong and so on. And there was one famous historian decided to do the checking, and he started off by disbelieving Luke. But halfway through, he came to believe that Luke was one of the best historians in the ancient world. He discovered they all checked out. Now, that's kind of evidence you can check. But often people say to me, 
and this is cutting a very long story short, they say to me, but look, you're a scientist, you know. In science, you do experiments, you check, you get evidence. Well, you can't do any experiment in that sense to check with Christianity. It's true. Who told you that? Of course you can. Of course you can. I wouldn't sit here for a nanosecond if I didn't believe you could check it out by experiment. Let me give you an example of that. Jesus Christ claims that if I face the mess I've made of my life and other people's life and repent of it, change my mind about it, and trust him as Savior and Lord who died for me, certain things will happen. I will receive forgiveness. A huge problem for many humans today. Forgiveness. Problems for many people in this room. I receive peace with God. I live a new hope. I live a new dynamic in life. You can check that out easily. I've seen it happen thousands of times. You see somebody and they're in the midst of depression and life is in a mess and so on, and then you meet them six weeks later and they're radiant, and you talk to them and say, what nurse happened to you? And they'll say something like, I met Christ or I came to trust Christ. Whatever language they use, when you see that again and again and again, and you see alcohol dependence turned into food on the table, when you see people who seem to have no hope or no objective in life begin to have meaning in life, when you see marriages saved from going on the rocks, and so on and so forth, and all these people connect it with trusting Christ, it would be very naive not to make the connection. And I sometimes say to audiences who ask me this question, I say, look, i tell you what, we'll meet here in a year's time. And I'll bring 500 people whose lives have been changed by trusting Christ. You bring 500 whose lives have been transformed by atheism, and then we'll talk. <laughs> it is very important not to give in to this idea that Christianity is not testable. Of course it's testable. Does that make sense to you? And just as we do experiments in science, of course it's not the same because there's a commitment. People often talk about skepticism. That's a, as if it was equal to atheism. It's, it's, it's very funny. I met the director of the Skeptical Society at Oxford. I was debating him in America, Michael Shermer, and he wears a big S for skeptic here, you see. <laughs> I said, what's that for? I knew really well. Oh, he said, I'm a skeptic. I said, so am I. We said, are you? And I said, the first thing I'm skeptical about is your atheism. <laughs> I said, have you any idea what skepticism means? The Greek word skeptine means to check out from a distance. I said, I could wear a badge like that, but I wouldn't bother. Do you think you're the only people who check things out from a distance? <laughs> what sort of attitude is this? Of course I check them out. Then comes the point. If you want to get to know a person, you've got to give up your distance. Isn't that true? And if you want to get to know God, you've got to give up your distance. And that's a very important thing. You check out from a distance. The early disciples did. You can read it in the Gospels. They had all kinds of difficulties, questions, problems. And the record of the Gospels is the skeptics checking out from a distance and coming gradually to give up that distance as incrementally the evidence grew that they could trust Christ. It's a wonderful thing when that happens. It happens, you know, when you fall in love. You look at her from a distance and then gradually the distance gets removed, doesn't it? You know the story. And it's exactly the same at this level. Getting to know a person. I often say to people, just remember in all of this that God is not a theory, he's a person. 
And getting to know a person is a little bit different from getting to know a theory. I did mention the question of age of the earth. Does anybody want me to comment on it? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Well, very briefly. Let me be very provocative, but you can be when you're old at the end of the evening. <laughs> I do not think scripture says anything whatsoever about the age of the earth or the universe. Let me prove that to you in just two or three lines. When it comes to Genesis, it's sad to see Christians fighting about it. You know, you will meet, in North America particularly, but all around the world, Christians who are equally godly, convinced of the whole inspiration of Scripture as I am. They agree on the pre-existence of Christ, on the Incarnation, on the Atonement, on the Resurrection, on the Ascension, on His coming again, but they disagree on Genesis 1. Have you noticed that? That ought to warn you that this isn't an easy topic. Secondly, the disagreement started long before Darwin or modern science. You can detect them among the early church fathers. All right? And what I do when I come to this, I say to people, how many of you believe that the earth doesn't move in relationship to the stars? How many of you here? None of you. So you're all moving earthers. The Bible says the earth doesn't move. Wow. So you clearly don't believe scripture on that, do you? The Lord has set the earth on its foundations that it shall not be moved. End of story. Now you see, it's very interesting. Not a single one of you believes that, literally. And yet for 1,700 years, that was a very controversial issue. When Galileo, you see, if we'd had this little discussion 500 years ago, nobody would have asked about the age of the earth. It was of no interest. But you would have been very concerned about the movement of the earth. Bible says it doesn't move. Galileo says it's moved. Isn't this terrible stuff? And yet you've all settled down. Why is that? Now, I analyze it. I've written a little book about this, so I'll shamelessly advertise it. Because it's very important to realize, ladies and gentlemen, that we've come to think about the question of the motion of the earth in a different way. And we now realize that stability is not a literal fixedness that it doesn't move. It's a much more sophisticated thing. That the earth is stable in its orbit and so on and so forth. And we're happy with that. We've shifted in our understanding because of science. Now that's interesting, isn't it? People say, oh, but you mustn't use science to interpret the Bible. It's far too late. You do it all the time. Jesus said, I am the door. Do you take that literally? Of course not. <laughs> but why do you not take it literally? Because you know what an ordinary door is. Your understanding of the natural world. Science, if you like. We wouldn't understand anything in Scripture if we didn't use our experience of the natural world. There's a lot of very shallow thinking goes on here, and I, I could spend a long time on it. But let me just go to the, the material question. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there follows a sequence of days. You've noticed that, I hope. <laughs> Have you noticed that the days each begin with, and God said? Yes? Well, what does that tell you? It tells you that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth was not on day one. It doesn't start with, and God said, let there be a heaven and earth. The sequence of days, each of them is prefaced by, and God said. That's point number one. Point number two. It's a very simple point of Hebrew grammar. And I've checked this with an expert because I'm not one. I even checked it with a professor of Hebrew at Oxford and of Cambridge. And to my amazement, they agreed. <laughs> and they told me that the first two verses of Genesis 1 are in one past tense. The sequence of days is written in a different tense in Hebrew. 
And what does that mean? Well, what I'm told it means is that what happened in verses 1 and 2 precedes what happens in this se sequence of days. Full stop. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then there's a sequence of days. Now here's the interesting thing. No matter what you believe about the days, the Bible says nothing about the age of the earth. It's interesting, isn't it? And yet we, blood has been shed over this. It's very sad to me because, of course, the world out there is not remotely interested in this topic. And when it sees us arguing about things that even simple grammar eliminates. Now, of course, that doesn't answer all the questions. But then you didn't ask all of them, so I'm not going to say any more. And what I will say, though, I take this as a serious question because I am concerned, very concerned, about young people who are passionate about science and who are also passionate about the authority and inspiration of Scripture. And it is a tragedy when I find them being put off, first of all, their science by being told that if you are a Christian, you have to believe in a certain interpretation of Genesis 1, and then I watch them lose their faith. That's a tragedy especially if they're losing their faith for something that isn't actually establishable. I'm prepared to be mocked at, ladies and gentlemen, for my faith in the resurrection. I'm not prepared to die for an interpretation of Genesis 1 when I've read about 25 different interpretations of Genesis 1. But have a look at my book if you like, and if you want to shoot me, I'll allow you to line up and have a shot. But I think we've had enough for tonight. Thank you very much indeed.